What is up engine lovers? Welcome to another episode of Iconic Engines. Today we're talking about an amazing engine that managed to put up with drifters for decades. Of course I'm talking about the Nissan SR20 DET. And yes, the T stands for turbo. And as always we're gonna cover its history, its specs and its tuning potential. Now, as you may know, the Iconic engine series is made possible by a company that's iconic when it comes to performance electronics. And of course, that company is AEM. Now, in the previous videos, I told you what makes AEM so great. So now I want to change things up a bit. And instead of just gushing about what makes AEM so great, I want to do super, super quick AEM product spotlights. And in today's spotlight, we got the CD7 Carbon Composite Digital Dash Display. Now this thing is the ultimate digital dash display. It's CAN based which allows it to work on any vehicle. It works with all AEM CAN devices as well as more than 250 non-AEM CAN devices. It has multiple fully customizable pages and unlimited warnings and alarms. Plus there are versions with GPS and data logging which is great if you do a lot of track days. It uses a flow molded carbon fiber housing which means that it's extremely light. Plus, it's open cockpit safe and fully readable in direct sunlight. And this is just the beginning. Honestly, this thing has too many features to list. It's everything you could want from a digital dash display and more. And for what it is, it's fairly priced. So instead of looking at a bunch of gauges, bring your dash into the next era and have it all fully customizable in one single beautiful sleek design. Links to the CD7 and more AEM stuff are in the description. The Nissan SR20 engine was made to replace the CA18 engine. And while the CA18 was a great engine, it actually no longer met many significant emission standards and Nissan had decided that it was too expensive to continue manufacturing the CA18. So when the time came for a successor, Nissan really stepped up its game and made the SR20 lighter, more powerful and more efficient compared to the CA18. Now, if you ask a car enthusiast about the placement of an SR20 in the engine bay, almost all will tell you that it's placed like this, you know, longitudinally. However, this isn't what the SR20 began its life like, the turbo one. The turbo one was first introduced in transverse engine placement in the engine bay of the Nissan Bluebird 2000 Triple S. Even more transverse engine placements followed in 1990. This is when the SR20 appeared in the engine bays of the Japanese market Pulsar GTIR and the European market Sunny GTIR. It wasn't until next year that we received the SR20 Turbo in the placement and setup that we all know and love. In 1991, the SR20 Turbo appeared in the Nissan 180SX the father of all drift cars. Here it was placed longitudinally in a pretty lightweight rear wheel drive car. The SR20 Turbo stayed with the Nissan S chassis all the way until its sad end in 2002. This is when Nissan was left without an entry level sports car. This is something I think that the entire uh, global car enthusiast community agrees that Nissan needs now. It's an entry level sports car, please give us one again. The S chassis was awesome. Now that being said, the, all around the world the S chassis was well received and global markets got the S chassis with different names, 180SX, 200SX, uh, doesn't matter, they were all SXy. So what makes the SR20 Turbo iconic? Uh, is it the specs? Is it the power output? Is it the technology? Is it the reliability? Is it... Well, it's none of that and it's actually all of that. When you look at the specs, the SR20 is a lightweight, uh, low displacement, high power output engine, but Japan had plenty of those in the 90s. It was also pretty reliable. Well, Japan had plenty of those in the 90s. The SR20 Turbo was made iconic not by Nissan, it was made iconic, actually it was made iconic by Nissan, but how iconic it was was revealed by car enthusiasts. And here's, here's why. To understand that, we have to go back to something very, very basic. 
we have to understand what drifting is. And I'm going to simplify it for you. Drifting is abuse. That's it. And while it's a motorsport today, and while it's beautiful and amazing and requires skill and craftsmanship and all of that, at the very core of a mechanical perspective, it's abuse. Cars aren't meant to drift. Uh, sports cars are meant to be driven a bit harder than your average economy car, but manufacturers never intended their cars, chassis and engines to be drifted and abused that badly. Uh, an engine in a drifting car goes through a tremendous amount of abuse. It's basically being bounced off the rev limiter for hours at relatively low speeds that don't allow the engine to cool off. An engine that can take drifting and doesn't complain is amazing by any standard. In the early days of drifting, before everybody was swapping 2JZs and LSs into everything, a 180SX was your best and easiest way to get into drifting. I mean, in the first ever drifting event outside of Japan, in 1996 at Willow Springs Raceway, Inada, Tsuchiya and Okazaki demonstrated to the Americans for the first time ever what drifting is all about. What car did they use? You guessed it, a 180SX. It was the best and easiest way to get into drifting. And while you may argue that a Toyota A86 is an equally good drift car, and while I may agree with that, the A86 never had from the factory something that the 180 Essex had. It was power. Now the A86 is an amazing chassis, but the 4AGE 16 valve engine with around 120 horsepower is pretty underpowered and you needed to either extensively modify that engine or do an engine swap to get the A86 to proper drift car status. It was so much easier with the 180SX. Basically it went like this. Step 1. Buy 180SX. Step 2. Watch Tsuchiya's Plus B Drift video. Step 3. Convince yourself you can do that too. Step 4. Crash. Step 5. Show everybody your crash photos and tell them you're an amateur drifter. Mission accomplished! Another thing that we have to remember when it comes to drifting, especially in the early days, is that drifters aren't really focused on engine building and maintenance and servicing. They're focused on seat time, and that is understandable. Drifting is fun. Uh, so the SR20 often went into drifting and abuse without any sort of major preparation. And then it changed hands from one drifter to another and continued to put up with all of this. I mean, an engine that is able to put up with drifting is amazing. An engine that's able to put up with drifting and drifters for decades is iconic. And even today, 30 years after it appeared in the market, an SR20 Turbo in an S chassis can still be your easiest entry into the world of drifting. These engines are plentiful, they're reliable, they're durable, they have an amazing aftermarket, and they can be easily tuned to achieve high horsepower figures with nothing but bolt-ons. And unlike a V8 or an inline 6 swap, an SR20 is going to retain that beautiful weight distribution of an S chassis. But if you think drifting is the only thing that the SR20 Turbo ever did, you're wrong. This engine has proven itself everywhere, from circuit racing, to endurance racing, to rallying, to time attack, and even on the drag strip. It has been putting smiles on car enthusiast faces for decades. The SR20 DET is a square engine design. It has 86 millimeters of bore and 86 millimeters of stroke. And just like many square engine designs, it delivers a great balance between power and torque. When it comes to the engine's architecture, unlike the CA18 that preceded it, uh, which had a cast iron block, the SR20 is an all aluminum design. We have a closed deck aluminum engine block and aluminum cylinder heads. 
Inside the aluminum engine block we can find cast iron cylinder liners and a fully counterweighted forged steel flat plane crankshaft. The connecting rods and pistons are both well designed, they're pretty beefy and they almost never cause any problems even when boost is increased on these engines. The pistons are cast but they do have a thermal coating on the top from the factory. The cylinder head is a dual overhead camshaft design with pent-roof combustion chambers. Underneath the valve covers we can find some low friction Y-shaped rocker arms opening and closing the valves. The valve sizes are pretty nice and we have 34.15 mm intake valves and 30.15 mm exhaust valves. Nissan was aiming for minimal maintenance on the SR20 engines and we have both of the cam gears being directly driven by a single roller timing chain. We also have some hydraulic valve lifters in the cylinder head. When it comes to the valve encoded angle it's pretty narrow at 29 degrees and we also have two different intake port designs. The earlier versions of the SR20 turbo engines which had fixed timing have this high angle intake port that is cast into the cylinder heads. These also had some pretty great airflow characteristics. On the other hand the later versions which had variable cam timing have a more traditional intake port design. The SR20 turbo engine received several tweaks and revisions throughout its relatively long production run. It started out with 200 horsepower, a Garrett T25 turbo, dumb ignition coils and fixed cam timing. But it ended with close to 250 horsepower, a T28 ball bearing turbo, smart ignition coils and variable intake cam timing. Here you can find a little chart of the engines, the cars they came in and their individual features so you can pause the video here and check out whatever you need. The SR20 Turbo is a tuner friendly engine. It shares a trait with many Japanese engines of the 80s and the 90s and that is that with nothing but bolt-ons and the proper ECU tune, you can get this engine to basically double its stock power output without the need to open it up and reinforce the internals. Since we're speaking about the internals, the safe power level for the internals of all the different SR20 turbo engines is around 400 horsepower. Now I have to repeat this, I repeat this all the time in my videos, safe power levels assume a good tune, they assume knock monitoring, they do not assume a poor tune based on guesswork. A poor tune is going to blow an SR20 and any other engine well below safe power levels. Your basic budget friendly stage one stuff with the SR20 Turbo is going to be simple things like upgrading the downpipe and the exhaust, maybe a colder intake and cranking up the boost a little bit. Most stock turbos of the SR20 run at around 7 psi of boost. You can increase this to around 12 to 13 psi before you reach the limits of what is a mostly stock setup. But this basic budget friendly stuff will only get you so far and you can expect around 50 to 60 extra horses from these simple upgrades. If you want to reach 400 horsepower on stock internals then you should consider more serious upgrades like a large front mount intercooler and you will of course need to upgrade your fuel pump as well as your injectors and you will likely need to upgrade your turbo. A Garrett GT2871R is a common choice and a great idea at power levels of around 400 to 450 horsepower. <laughs> If you're aiming for 400 horsepower it's also a great idea to ditch the stock ECU in favor of a standalone aftermarket ECU. This is going to allow you to get rid of the stock airflow meter and it's also going to open a bunch of other tuning options for you. While many have succeeded reaching 400 horsepower on stock internals without swapping the cams, it's actually a good idea to upgrade your camshafts as well because they can do wonders for your power curve and really change the feel of your engine at power levels of around 300 to 400 horsepower. <laughs> if 
if you want to go well above 400 horsepower, it's time to take out the engine and take it apart. Uh, the stock sleeves of the SR20 engine can be bored over 0.5 millimeters only twice before it's time to re-sleeve the engine. But re-sleeving the engine is a good idea. If you go for some ductile iron aftermarket sleeves, you can actually significantly increase the bore of the SR20. And you can go as far as 90 millimeters of bore, which gives you a displacement of almost 2.2 liters on the SR20, or even more if you decide to spend the money on a stroker kit. Also at serious power levels, it's a good idea to swap the stock hydraulic lifters for a solid lifter setup. This minimizes the risk of a rocker arm being flung around uh, underneath your valve covers and creating all sorts of havoc uh, in your engine. So if you choose to upgrade your internals with some serious forged pistons and forged connecting rods, the sky really becomes the limit with an SR20 engine and builds of well over 1000 horsepower become a reality. So those are the basics when it comes to the history, the specs and the tuning potential of the amazing little Nissan SR20 turbo engines. I hope you enjoyed that and found it useful and informative. And now it's time to end the video what we always end iconic engines videos with and that is some cringy rap. In stock form, I'm as rare as a unicorn, but you can still find me if you just stop watching all the porn. Once you do find me, then go and say yay, because a lot of drift tax is what you gotta pay. But I'm an SR20, small and strong, with me under the hood, you just can't go wrong.